All right, we're on the phone with my buddy Dave Jack from Cleveland, Ohio. He is uh, he is my my friend, and uh, and I've known him for a long time. He used to formerly run, uh, I guess, or write for the Sea Town and Down website, and uh, did a little. Uh, I guess it would have been a podcast today, but it was for Static Radio. Is that correct, Dave? It, it was at no, no static radio. No static the radio. There we <laughs> yeah, go. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. There was no static on that radio. <laughs> I got that right. All right. There's static on here all the time. Believe that's that. That's okay. Stat- static's okay. <laughs> that's, we, we're still trying to figure out our our equipment issues, but I think we got it. I think we got it working. Gary right has now. worked really hard. the The formula <laughs> that we use is we buy some pretty quality stuff, and then as cheap as we can the rest of the things until money comes through <laughs> and. uh that's the way to do it. They'll piece it together. And it works every now and then. Awesome. There you go. Hey, it sounds good. It all so, sounds good on this end of the phone. So I appreciate you guys having me on. Definitely. So the reason fun. I called my buddy Dave and asked him to come on the show with us today is because Dave was fortunate enough to go as a fan. I didn't even know that fans could go to this. Spent the weekend in Indianapolis at the Combine, something I would really like to do. The draft is one of my favorite things of the year. And I hit him up and said, hey, first thing, who the Browns looking at? Who you, who you like? Okay, who who's standing out for us? But B, can you come on and tell us about your experience? Tell us who you saw, everything. Yeah, no, it was it was so it was, uh, on the combine as a whole. I guess not a whole, whole lot of people knew that you could attend that thing. I found out a couple of years ago. Uh, my friend Dan uh, had had mentioned that there's you know fans that are able to attend this. Um, the tickets are free. You don't have to pay anything for them, which for the NFL, that's unheard that's, of. I mean, nothing's crazy. The NFL. Yeah, it's nuts. Um, it's actually put on by an organization uh, that does, it's called On Camera Audience, I believe is the name of the, uh, the, the group that actually brings you into uh, the, the combine. I would bet the and XFL is working for those people. <laughs> Just trying to get bodies in a building. <laughs> that's probably, that would be a good idea if, if, I, if uh, the XFL, um, if I was them, I'd maybe reach out, but they do things like, uh, you know, the crowds behind Michael Strahan uh, at the pregame shows is it Monday, Thursday Night Football, or Monday, I can never keep straight which one he does. Um, you know, the crowds behind them when they're broadcasting live are brought on by them. You get, like, uh, tickets to talk shows uh, through them as well. So they do things like this, but oh, it, it was free. Sense. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was a free thing. All you do is go on and literally just request tickets, and then a couple weeks later you get an email saying, okay, the tickets are available, and you just – sign up for whatever days you want to go and your tickets come in the mail. It was actually, when we got down there, it was kind of funny. It's like, is this kind of a too good to be true type of a thing? Like, you know, do we just get fooled into something somehow? Or, you know, cause we're walking around and, you know, asked a couple people, Hey, we've got tickets to get into, uh, you know, Lucas Oil uh, stadium to watch the combine. And there was one guy who was working. They have, uh, the NFL has a fan fest, uh, in Indianapolis actually too, for, uh, for the, uh, combine. And we had asked one of the guys working the fan fest. And he's like, I don't think you get into that. Uh, that's you know that's that's for players only. They're they're you know these this is a job interview for these guys, and I don't think they let fans in there. But um, sure enough, that guy I guess didn't know what he was talking about, and we were able to get in. And yeah, it was it, it was it was a pretty cool experience. I'll say that. So so what kind of access do you actually get? Like what can because these aren't all in one location, right? Like it's it's kind of spaced out all over everywhere. What can yeah. you actually see? So they uh, they kind of advertise or you know the obviously the marquee event there is the 40 yard dash and that's kind of really what they push that you're going to see uh and as far as uh bringing you into the stadium and uh uh you know seating you you're definitely seated in the best possible position uh to see that you're seated on you're in the upper level kind of in the nosebleeds um on the same side of the field that they run the 40 yard dash and while all of that is going on they're also doing uh the vertical jump and the broad jump on the other end of the field um, so you're able to sort of see those things as far as, you know, you could look over and see the people are jumping or people are, you know, doing whatever. You can't see who's doing those things and you really can't see how far anybody's jumping or how high anybody's jumping. So they, so really they, they don't put this on, dash. it's not on like the Jumbotron. It's not it, like you just kind of. No, so they, you're, you're they actually do. It's kind of, it's kind of, if, if I had one critique of the event, I would say they're, um, they're in stadium fan experience portion of that as far as you know what you mentioned getting things on the jumbotron uh is a little bit lacking they sort of explain that to you because this isn't really you know this isn't like uh the draft which is obviously it's for nfl teams but they made it a real fan friendly thing or like a game or training camp where you have access to these guys um you know because in all reality these are you know 
college players who are auditioning for a job. It's a form of a job interview. Right. Um, so they kind of limit things as far as that goes. Like they have, there's the jumbotrons that are up there. There were two that were active. Well, there's one on either side of the field. Um, the one, uh, anytime a player uh, went to run, uh, you know, a 40 or did whatever they were doing, they put the player's name up there and his measurables and what school he went to and, you know, what's, you know, if he was a defensive end, defensive tackle, linebacker, whatever he was. Uh, and then on the scoreboard opposite of that, um, they had, um, you know, a camera view of what he was doing a little bit closer up. And then each section that you're sitting in has a TV uh, mounted like to the, uh, uh, the guardrail. So there's a, an actual television there. So that's nice if you want to, you know, get a closer look, but it's, it's kind of funny. It's like you, you, you drive all this way to the combine and you want to see these guys live and everything. And, you know, the first thing you notice is a giant television, right? <laughs> it's like, I could just be doing this from my couch. Yeah. Um, but you know what? Once you kind of get accustomed to that, um, you're really more focused. At least I was more focused on what's going on in the field. The big difference is, though, um, there's no – like if you're watching the broadcast on NFL Network, you know, while the, whoever's running this 40-yard dash or doing whatever he's doing, you know, that guy's name's on the screen. And in the case of the 40, uh, it'll show his time, you know, his 10-yard, his 10 20-yard, uh, 20 and then 40 time. Right. Um, they actually – I don't know if they can't or they choose not to show that information in the stadium on any television because they don't want guys focusing on, you know, oh, so-and-so ran this, so I want to try to beat that, or I want to see what my time was right away. Uh, one, because they want guys focusing on the workout, and two, because all that stuff is unofficial until, you know, everything's verified later on. So you're sort of, I mean, when you're watching these guys run, you don't really know what they're running, uh, you know, instantly as far as, you know, Rich Eisen isn't in your ear saying, Hey, so and so just ran a you know a, a four seven nine forty or whatever. You do get an in ear radio. Uh, it's sort of a, a funny looking. It's not an earbud or anything like that. Um, it goes kind of wraps around your ear. It's kind of big and clunky looking, um, but that goes you know over your ear and uh, you get the uh, audio uh, feed from the NFL Network broadcast. That's kind of nice. cool. It, it's nice and it helps you with certain things, but the, the, the problem there is they're also taking commercial breaks. So during a commercial break, these guys are still working out. So when they go to break, you're not totally sure what's going on. And then at the <laughs> same time, you know, you sort of get accustomed to, I, I equated it to uh, like, if you're usually watching an NFL game, you know, you don't have season tickets. So you don't go to games. So you usually watch it at home on your couch. And then, you know, you go to one or two games a year and you get so used to, you know, not necessarily just the color commentary and the play-by-play, but all the stats that pop up on the screen while you're watching the game. You, yeah. know, you see, you, no one has to tell you that it's second and eight because you can look at the television and see that it's second and eight. That well, it's sense. sort of the same thing. Yeah, right, exactly. Sort of the same thing here. You know, the game day experience when you're in the stadium, is, you, you don't really have that right in front of you. I mean, the stuff's posted around the stadium, but it's, you know, if something happens in the field, you know, as far as an injury goes, you don't really know what's going on. So it's sort of the same with that uh, as far as, you know, uh, attending a game goes. It's similar to that with the combine in that, you know, there's times where you're not really sure, you know, who's running and, you know, you know where they're from and what they're doing. But there was four or five, six guys would run sometime while the broadcast was going on in my ear. And, you know, the guys on television are talking about whatever they're te- talking about. And you don't know what this guy's 40 time was. You just saw him run and you don't, you might not hear for, you know, a couple you know minutes later until they brought up, you know, so-and-so ran this 40 time, or you may never hear it because they just don't acknowledge whoever it is. Uh, I know when I was watching the running backs, they had uh, Mark Ingram and Maurice Jones drew in studio. So I just heard them talking back and forth about <laughs> different, it had nothing to do with anything that was going on in the field. They were just talking back and forth about, you know, whatever they were talking about. And it's one of those things where when you're watching on television and you have all the graphics giving you any sort of guidance, it's nice. But when that's your only connection to what's going on, it's a little bit of a struggle. So we realized quickly that if we want to get anything uh, as far as results go, um, check your phone, you know, because the combine website will update that with uh, pretty instant results. So we were doing that. The catch is um, during the 40 yard dash during the other events, because we see the uh, position drills going on, too. Uh, So when uh, like the defensive linemen are running there, you know, the the hoop drill or whatever else they were doing, um, we were able to actually see that. And you're able to cheer and clap and make noise. But they had uh, representatives in each section, and uh, they told you this ahead of time. 
when the 40 yard dash is going on, there is, there's never allowed to be any videos taken, whether you're allowed to talk or not. They never want you to be able to take a video. Um, you're allowed to take pictures as long as it's only your phone. You can't have cameras or anything else in there. Um, and you can do that anytime except during the 40 yard dash. You have to be silent and you can't be on your phone. They don't want anything going on to, to I guess it's to disturb or to, to not disturb the, the players on the field because, you know, uh, I don't know, any, any sort of a, you know, hundredth of a second can make a big difference for these guys. Um, so they, I mean, they make multiple announcements that, hey, during this entire 40 yard dash time, which could be up to an hour, you have to be completely silent. You can't get up to use the bathroom. You can't do, you can't do anything. All you can do is sit there. Um, now how, that, how many people were actually sitting it, it, because it's, it's just, it's like a marked off section, right? So ha, how many so, people are actually there? It was hard to get a real gauge. I mean, there was a good amount of people there. I'd say, uh, you know, definitely a few hundred people, maybe, a, you know, they, maybe closer to a thousand. Um, it's hard to really get a gauge on it because you're sitting in your section and um, the different sections next to you are sort of halfway filled up, but not really. And it's only the, it's only half of the upper bowl that they even let people in in the top sections. Huh. So it's not like okay. this is, you know, a, a game day environment, but, you know, I'm sure that's by design to kind of keep, uh, you know, keep the crowd noise down when they need to keep down and, you know, kind of really police this event. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little strange during that 40 yard dash time when no one's supposed to be saying anything. I still had my phone up kind of propped up. So I was able to get instant results as far as the times go. Uh, but yeah, they don't want you doing anything during that. Wow. That's, that's kind of, that's kind of unbelievable. All right. So let's get yeah. to who, who stood out for you and, uh, and, and what'd you like, what you didn't like, or, yeah. or could you, could you even notice a difference when you were in there? Like, because I could yeah, so, imagine like, Henry Ruggs ran a four two seven, but yeah. nobody uh, there knew that. But it, knew that, right? Yeah, it, they all so, look really fast, right? Yeah, like at well, least that, in person. That, that, yeah, so that's that's kind of the most the thing I was excited to see the most was that you know on television, yeah, everybody looks, you know, they kind of look. It's hard to get a gauge of on the TV screen how fast someone looks compared to somebody else. You actually um, have a good right. view of seeing who looks fast. Then, yeah, you you sort of have a nice eagle eye view, but even still, it was it was you know there there'd be somebody who you think, oh man, that guy. You know, that guy really, you know, scooted down the line and his 40 time, you know, was maybe, you know, as far as a linebacker goes, maybe a four, seven, four, eight. And it's like, oh, maybe that guy wasn't as fast as I thought. And you'd see somebody else run. It's like, oh, I think that guy's going to be a little slow when he's running out, you know, I don't know, a four, four, seven, nine, or I'm sorry, a four, four, nine or something like that. So um, it's still a little hard to get your bearings just because, uh, uh, you know, different, different guys have different builds and some guys look smoother than other people. Um, but once you kind of see a few guys run, you could see, you, you know, to look for a couple of things, mostly how these guys get off the line and a couple other things on their 40 time. Um, as far as, well, I guess I'll start with the offensive linemen. That was the first group that I saw. Um, and unfortunately, so they break them into different groupings. There's like two or three different groupings for offensive linemen. I was not able to see Makai Becton run live, um, which I was bummed out about that after I heard his <laughs> time. Um, but I'll tell you what, uh, and this isn't going to be a unique take or anything. Tristan Wirfs, uh, that guy is, is – there's not wide receivers who are as athletic as this guy is. It's unbelievable to see him move around, and not even just in the 40-yard dash time. I mean, when they're, when they're running their different positional drills and, you know, these guys are just you know, doing the agility things and changing direction and everything, if Wirfs wanted to or an offensive coordinator wanted to get creative – they could use this guy as a tight end and have him run a couple. I mean, nothing crazy or anything, but, you know, inside the 20-yard line and, and use him in goal line situations if they want him to get nuts. This guy is unbelievable. Um, him and Jedrick Willis really separated themselves. Now, this is just from uh, a workout uh, perspective. I don't watch as much film as I have in my past life, um, but just from a workout perspective. Yeah, you can, we're only asking guys, for this window of, of, of what, you, yeah. what you've seen and know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, these, I mean, these guys uh, – as far as I can see, really sort of separated themselves uh, from the other group of uh, offensive tackles who were there with, you know, throughout this whole draft process, it's been uh, Tristan Wirfs, it's been Jedrick Lewis, Makai Becton has sort of risen up draft boards, Josh Jones, Austin Jackson, Andrew Thomas. Uh, those have sort of been the six guys that you kind of hear mentioned, uh, and, you know, any, and no, no real particular order. Um, Wirfs and Wilkes really separated themselves for me. Um, I was surprised to see Andrew Thomas actually people say he had a good combine which I think he did um for the most part he looked slow to me and that could have just been because Wirfs and Wills looked so athletic and so quick but there was a couple times where Andrew Thomas looked like he was maybe going at 75 80 percent I know in one of the on-field drills I would have to do it was, it was a change of direction drill where they got a 
go one way or another based on which way a coach points the football after they've made a couple different breaks. And he was the only one who actually ran the wrong direction, oh. uh, which I thought was a little strange. You know, oh. yeah, that's that's kind of I, I wanted because I really liked him as a prospect. You know, I've seen a little bit of his a little bit of his tape. I've seen him play. Um, he's been mocked to the Cleveland Browns uh, in a few different mock drafts. Seen that. Um, I really I really wanted to see him look good, and I don't know that he looked bad. It's just that Wurfs and Wilkes looked so good, and uh, Beckton from the tape that I saw them in the combine looked so good. And he's, I mean, he's, he is, I mean, his 40 time, I think was a five, two, which was the slowest out of those five guys. Um, so he is actually slower than everybody else, but he really looked a lot slower. And like I said, sometimes it looks like he was only going at about 80, 85% uh, during his drills. So um, I was a little disappointed about him there. Uh, one other guy that kept jumping out at me too, um, that wasn't the, again, offensive lineman, offensive tackle, who's not part of the top guys. Um, his name is Matthew Paird. Uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of him before. Offensive tackle from uh, UConn. Um, I didn't know a whole lot about him. Uh, I, I looked at his measurables. I mean, the guy has prototypical size for a tackle, 6'7", 318 pounds. Actually has an 86-inch wingspan, which is massive. Um, as far as, you know, the scouting reports I've read on him, he's sort of unpolished, maybe a swing tackle, third-round type of a guy. But, you know, I'm watching these guys work out, and every single time there was this one guy who was like, man, this guy looks – he moves really well. Or he, he always seemed to catch my eye. And I got his – you know, they all have their offensive line numbers. I don't remember which one he was. Um, but it ended up being the same guy every single time. Just looked so smooth, so athletic. Uh, ran a 5.06.40, which was good for eighth best among the linemen. Had a 30-inch vertical, which tied him for 11th, and a broad jump 113 inches, which tied him for 6th. So the guy's athletic, and it really, really showed up in the combine. I think he really did a whole lot to boost his draft stock. And if someone now – who's on my radar because as a Browns fan, we need two tackles and probably a guard. Right, um, and we're not going to be able, we're not going to be able to replace all three of those positions with a blue chip type of a player. We just don't have those kind of draft picks this year uh, unless they move up. So you're going to be looking at sort of a developmental guy, uh, probably in the mid to late rounds, you know, and I think this could be a guy who could fit that mold, especially with sort of a wide uh, zone block scheme that the Browns are going to be running this year. I don't want to turn this into a Brown show. Uh, but the <laughs> We're, we're going to turn this into a Brown at. show. That, that's, that's okay. Well, two verse one. I guess he, uh, Gary doesn't really have a choice here. That's ha- that's that's that's, that's happening. That's happening. <laughs> but uh, he was someone who really uh, really stood out for me as far as the offensive line uh, players go. Um, and he is a big boy. I'm looking at him right now. He, yeah, six seven three eighteen. That that, that eighty six inch wingspan. It's funny because I would read some scouting reports saying that's he's got a, a lot of length, garage, but he's, man. he's he still lets guys get into his body. So there's clearly some technique things going on there. Um, but it's fine. I mean, there's, there, you can teach technique. You can't teach six, seven with an 86 inch wingspan. And for a guy that big to move like he does. So he's already in my mind, a little bit ahead of the curve. As long as you're not bringing him in to be your starting left tackle from day one. Uh, I think with, especially the Browns bringing in Bill Callahan as their offensive line coach, I think that could go a, a, a long way to helping a guy like this develop, uh, in, into a, you know, a legitimate starting offense tackle. So as far as a tackle goes, that was someone who really jumped out at me. Um, I, I wasn't able to see, and it, it killed me. Um, I was there for uh, defensive line and linebackers. And uh, Indianapolis, I'm, I'm about five and a half hours away, and I had to stop in Beaton to drop somebody off on the way home. So I was trying to stay as late as I possibly could to see these linebackers. I really, 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 really wanted to see Isaiah Simmons work out. Uh, and it just ended up getting too late, and we had to get back on the road. Um, obviously, I'm sure everyone's familiar with his workout, and I, he's at the top of my list. Actually, he's a freak. Draft at 10. Yeah. Oh, but it's unbelievable. I mean, if I had one-tenth of one percent of his athletic ability, I would consider myself <laughs> blessed. Um, but this is also a really good year to stay on the defense uh, if you need uh, defensive line help, uh, specifically interior defensive line help. Now, speaking just from a workout perspective, um, these guys on the interior are big. These guys look imposing, and these guys can move. Um, I was kind of keeping an eye out because the Browns obviously again need help on the you know defensive front, which they seem to need every single year, no matter how many free agents they bring in or how many guys that they draft. Um, I keep talking about the forty-yard dash time. That's not the be-all, end-all, but I look at that for especially some of these big guys because you know. No offensive or defensive lineman's really running forty yards down the field, but you look at how explosive these guys can be. Um, and as far as the times go as a whole, there were only uh, two guys from the uh, interior defensive line or the defensive line, I believe, as a whole, not even just the interior guys, who had a 40 time greater than 5'2". Everybody else was running sub 5'2", uh, uh, 
40 yard times. The two, a few guys that really stood out from those groups were uh, the Davis brothers from Nebraska, Khalil and Carlos. Um, they come in at 308 and 313 pounds, and they're running 475 and 48240s. Uh, Neville Gallimore from Oklahoma, 479 uh, at 62340. Um, I'll throw an SEC guy in there for you, Raekwon Davis. Um, it's six six three eleven. Is around five one two forty, and then I gotta go Ohio State here. Devon Hamilton, uh, it's six four three twenty. Is moving like a deer now. It's five one four forty. You know, when you hear that, especially you think of some of these other positional guys like uh, Rugs. We mentioned earlier, around a four two seven. Yeah. Uh, to me, a guy who's six four three hundred twenty pounds who hangs out in the middle of the, of the offensive line, around a five one four forty. That's almost as impressive as someone can. You know, a, a skill position guy who you expect to be fast. Running a four two seven, so I mean, there's guy after guy after guy. Uh, these guys are blowing these workouts away. Oh, and by the way, Derek Brown, who is probably the best interior lineman in the uh, in the draft, looked like a normal guy compared to the rest of these guys as far as a workout goes. Now you put the tape on, and it's a completely different situation. Derek Brown is a man among boys, but you really get a sense for how athletic. Uh, some of these, you know, real big defensive linemen are, uh, and like I said, just strictly from an athletic pr- perspective, um, this is a really good year, I think, to need some interior defensive line help. Um, someone who disappointed too on that side, if I can keep rambling on here, uh, AJ and Penta uh, out of Iowa. I know at one point there was a couple of people, and I think this was just maybe to be different and get their name out there, uh, had him rank higher than Chase Young from Ohio State, which is just asinine in my that, opinion. That's, that's clickbait. Um, we don't. We yeah, don't yeah that's, that's that's exactly to, to be fair, AJ Epinesa was really good. All that's year, fine. That's fine. But he, he was never as good yeah. as Chase Young. Yeah, it's, that's fine. No, that's somebody who's and, just trying to, yeah, stand and out. I, I, I think he's a guy. You, you see this every year. There's someone who, usually, it's not just someone. There's plenty of guys who, the season progresses, the season goes on, the season finishes, and the numbers are there. And you watch them play, and you think, man, these, this, this, whoever this is, this guy is a monster. And then after games finish, leading up to the draft, you know, things like the combine or other things start to happen and you start poking holes in these guys where maybe there aren't really holes. Um, Empeneza, Empeneza didn't really wow anybody as far as, you know, on-field drills or speed. He, he sort of looked average compared to everybody else. And I was actually a little disappointed in some of the things that he did. He didn't look – when you look at strictly at his numbers, which you shouldn't box for a scout, but you look at his numbers, you think, man, this, this guy's really going to light up the combine. I really want to see him. And, and – he really didn't, as far as the other, you know, edge rushers go. He didn't separate himself, looked worse than some of those other guys. Probably a case of this guy is not a workout warrior. He's more of a when the lights come on, it's time to go type of a situation. That makes um, sense. But I was a little, I, I was a little disappointed in that. Just I wanted to see some somebody else other than a, a Chase Young. I know there's a few other guys in the draft, but somebody else other than a Chase Young uh, really kind of light things up at the combine, which he ended up not even working out. I did see him walking around. Um, they had, by the fan experience during during the combine, they'll kind of put some, I guess, lack of a better way to put this guardrails up when the players are coming through. And I was probably 10, 15 feet from Chase Young, and that is not a man that you want to mess with. <laughs> Let me tell you what that is a that is a big boy who if, if if you rub him the wrong way, that might be the last thing that you rub. Um, but uh, yeah, I was I was a little disappointed with him, uh, Penza, uh, and then as far as the running backs go. The running backs look like running backs. No one really jumped out there aside from uh, – now, i got to be careful, too, when I mention all this stuff because I'm in a dynasty league uh, with Chris, so I can't give away all my <laughs> secrets on the skill positions here. Um, but Jonathan Taylor, I was surprised uh, what sort of at least 40 speed that he had. Oh, he was fast. Um, I was, yeah, that's what I, I was, I was, I was, like, I was really surprised. I, I, I thought DeAndre Swift was going to be uh, one of the leaders in the clubhouse as far as the 40 time goes there, and he did okay. Yeah, uh, oh, he, he was not nearly what, what I thought. I, your, your boy could have no. told you that. Oof. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm calling I, I, that. If he's the first running back taken this year, he will be a bust. But I, I, see, I can't tell if this is posturing or what this is. So it's I'm, not, I'm, I'm sure I'm you, you, you can go back and listen to anything <laughs> I've said. I've watched this guy play good teams, all right? Yeah. And, and I'm going to tell you, LSU played Georgia last year in Baton Rouge, okay? Now, LSU's team last year, not, not the 2019 team, the 2018 team, Nowhere near as good as Georgia, all right? Right, right. We manhandled them up and down the field in offense and defense. Swift played 80% of the game. When they pulled Swift and put in Holyfield, Holyfield got eight yards a touch. And that's not he touched the ball six times and broke one for 65 yards, and so his numbers were inflated. 
every time he touched the ball, he got eight plus yards. And I'm thankful that Kirby Smart's a moron, and they kept just (laughs) feeding the ball to Swift. LSU's linebackers and defensive linemen got to him over and over and over again. You can't outrun those guys. You're not going to make it in the NFL. You're just not. Yep, yep. Well, you know, it may be a case, too, that as far as workouts go, he's he's more quick than fast. I heard that a couple times, too. Um, I guess I wasn't as blown away by Swift's "Quote unquote higher time as I was with Taylor around a four three nine forty. Um, the only other guy who really stood out, um, you know, if people are looking for a, I guess in the NFL a, a, a late round running back because this is a fairly deep class this year. Uh, a guy from Appalachian State, uh, Darrington Evans. Um, he ran a four four one forty, which is the second fastest time among running backs. Uh, he tested well in some of the other uh, categories too. So uh, as far as the speed guys go, it was it was Taylor and it was Darrington Evans. Uh, but beyond that, running backs look like running backs. They are mostly in the four fives, and you know, yeah. all of them look about the same. On the jersey, they they yeah, know how to run the name str- on the jersey. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they, they know how to run in a straight line, line pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I, yeah. I kind of hate what the combine does. I I'm I'm the old man that says, why do we test people like this when they're not yeah. going to do any of this in football? Is it right. possible to put them in a pad and a hold a football while they run? At least if they're going to do that. Um, or it, 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 at least make them take a couple laps around the stadium first because no one's running, a, you know, in, in the NFL side from the first play of the game. And even then, then you had your on-field workouts. That's right. I mean, no one's running this fast in the fourth quarter. No. I, don't, I don't care what you're for. You're not doing it, it from a three-point stance. I mean, you're, exactly. you have to slow up, yeah. take a handoff, and then go. I mean, and you can't you can't start over if you you know if you stumble or, or something else along those lines. So it, it is a little silly. And they actually, I was surprised. Um, they did make a point uh, a few times to say, hey, the combine originally started out as, you know, a, a reason for uh, NFL teams to get the top prospects together, really to check out their medicals, which is probably the biggest part of the combine. Yep. The medicals and, medicals and nobody interviews. Talks about. Yep, that's, that's, that's what most of it is. Um, and the on-field stuff, I'm, I'm sure, is more just to uh, let these guys run around a little bit. So, it's a show. Um, well, and I yeah, actually exactly. think I'm okay with all of the top prospects not – performing we know where they're going to go let's right. save this time for these other guys that might not get drafted and have an opportunity yeah. to showcase their speed their agility their ability now i'm i'm a sparks guy if i'm going to be a combine guy i want but the problem is is watching it at home i get this information you don't i don't know if you get it there but like i want to watch the the broad jump i want to watch the three cone drill i want to watch the things that show explosive agility and that's not always running in a straight line. Oh, somehow we lost Mr. David Jack. <laughs> Let's see if we can get him back. I, I won't even I won't even stop the recording. We will just hey, I couldn't get to my phone right now. Oh no. He's still on the other line. I wonder if he knows he hung up. <laughs> or if it was a problem with his phone. Hey, Dave, I could... Oh interesting. I'm curious uh, his thoughts on – did he say that he didn't get to watch, like, quarterbacks or – Yeah, he didn't watch quarterback. He didn't get there until – I don't think he was there until – I think he was there Saturday and Sunday. We, we'll, we'll get to that one if I can get him back on the line. It's, we'll, we'll see. I couldn't get to my phone oh, right now. But dang it. Interesting. So, oh. Uh, yeah. I, oh, here we go. Here we go. We're good. You there? Give me Ready? a second. All right, we're back. Did I get the Did I get the hook already? No, no, no. I don't know what happened. I don't know if it was you or me, but but we're good. Um, but okay, it, cool. I was just talking about, and I don't know where we lost you. I was in the middle of talking about how I like Sparks guys. I like I like the three cone drill. I like the broad jump guys. Yep. Those yep. types of things. How much of that do you actually get to watch? And information do you get from watching that? Do they show you what their numbers are? Can you see who's explosive and who's not? No, and I was really disappointed about that. So there. They're on the, when let, let's let's say the uh, running backs are on their forty. There's another positional group uh, over on the other side of the field, and I can't even really tell who it is uh, doing uh, both the vertical and the broad jump. So you could see guys over there doing something. You can't tell who it is. And you, can't you can't tell, tell how what long they're doing, or how yeah. high they're jumping. Right, and the information is not really posted anywhere. So um, I agree with you. That stuff probably is a bigger indicator as as far as athletic ability than a 40-yard dash time because it shows how explosive an athlete you are. That's right. Um, 
you really don't get to see that. I wish they would utilize uh, you know, those screens that I talked about earlier. Put a camera over there by those guys. You know, let let people who are there kind of get an up close view of those guys really doing some pretty amazing athletic stuff. I think that would be a really cool thing to see. But no, I wasn't able to see a whole lot of that information or a whole lot of those drills. Unfortunately, it was mostly the forty and then uh, the on field divisional drills. Yeah. All right. One one last question about the combine, then we'll get into some other things. Um, sure. While you were in Indianapolis, you rub elbows with anybody of notice. I mean, did you see Kevin Clark <laughs> rolling around? Did you, did you get so, to bump into to to Rich Eisen? A couple didn't didn't see Rich Eisen, unfortunately. I mean, from from afar, but not not all that close. Uh, we were at a bar and saw Sean O'Hara uh, sitting at the corner doing a. Uh, I believe he was doing a boilermaker, or maybe it was an Irish car bomb. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> but the biggest one that I saw uh, was. Uh, God, his name is blanking me right now. It's not Scott Boris. It's Drew Rosenhaus. Oh yeah, um, yep. we were we were walking around, sort of in the Indianapolis. Kind of cool because I bet that guy was the looking like he was running for mayor. He, you know what? It was it was hilarious because we were just kind of walking around, making our way to the combine, and we hear someone sort of behind us talking kind of loudly on a clearly on a phone call, and uh, my friend Brian turned around and looked at him and kind of nudged us that. Hey, that's that's Drew Rosenhaus behind us. And you turn around, like, oh my God, that's Drew. The dude's having a conversation about people on a speakerphone. I mean, you think this guy would be <laughs> surrounded by security, you know, noise canceling, this and that, or you know, maybe some sort of a mobile soundproof studio when he's on the phone. The guy's on speakerphone. I mean, he wasn't saying anything. I couldn't, you know, really tell what he was saying, and I'm sure he wasn't negotiating any sort of a deal. Um, but he's just walking around on speakerphone. He was clearly talking about a couple players. I'm not sure exactly what he was saying. Um, but, yeah, that was probably the highest profile guy that I saw there. Um, I think a lot of the people uh, kind of maybe bounce out uh, once the interviews and everything are over. And then the events go to 11 o'clock. So after that, oh, I'm wow. sure they're breaking down film. I mean, yeah, so that, that's the big that. change this year. Is they, they move the uh, – usually the, uh, the workouts would be in the morning. Yeah, they, it'd be, it'd be during the day, and they moved it because of prime yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah, moving to the front time, which yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're trying to make TV dollars off this. I'm sure. Well, if they're going to make TV but, dollars, um, put some more cameras around that thing. And uh, that's what I said. But I, I think they're, they're they're probably going to try to take this on the road in a couple of years. I think you're going to see the combine in Los Angeles or South Beach or New York City or something crazy like that. If they're going to take it on the road, then they need to get guys like you that were fans there, and they hey, we have <laughs> information that you went. Can you tell us what we can do to actually make this exciting? Because right now, if you take that on the road, that's going to suck. Yeah, no, and I, I agree. If, if they try to make this some sort of a big kind of event, uh, I, and I'm sure there's more things they can do as far as, you know, there's a whole other section that I didn't even bother to check out where I believe we could go do the wide receiver golf drill if I wanted to go and make an ass out of myself or, you know, <laughs> really want to get a, a, a laugh. I could go on a 40 yard dash and then I'd still be running it if I got there on Thursday. Um, so there are those types of things there. But as far as making this an event like like uh, like the NFL draft is, where they travel around now, they really have to up their game a little bit. But you know, on the other side of that, if I'm the NFL or if I'm the agents or if I'm the uh, maybe the NCAA, I don't want that because that's not what this event is necessarily supposed to be. Uh, but I think it's only a matter of time before that happens. Yeah. All right. So let's get into Browns pick at ten. You're yep. the GM. You get to put the hat on. I'll be I'll be yep. the assistant to the GM. What uh? What, who who are we taking? So if, if he happens to fall, I don't know that I'm necessarily using assets to move up, but I'm not going to do it as long as I don't get nuts. Um, I know we need – I just got finished saying we need three offensive linemen. If Isaiah Simmons happens to still be around there at 10, um, I don't even let the clock start to run. I mean, if I'm the Browns, I have two cards <laughs> you know, there. Yeah. One card with his name already on it, and then a blank card for whoever you're probably going to have to leave the draft because I don't think there's a chance uh, he gets past Carolina. Uh, that's the, that's the, the only there, team in yeah. front of that's the only team in front of us that think that I think will take him though. That's the problem. Yeah, I think Everybody else is going offense. Probably, probably you may see a you know defender here and there mixed in. You know, uh, Jeff Akuda, uh might I know he's been going to uh, uh, Detroit in a lot of the box, but if, if he's there at ten, I'm taking him. Uh, if not, uh, either Tristan Wirfs or Jedrick Willis, either of those two guys happen to be there. Um, after seeing all this stuff, I really, really hope it's Wirfs. Um, I know Beckton's a little bit bigger and seems to be just as athletic. I, I think Worst is a little bit more versatile where you've seen him be. Uh, he was a right tackle at Iowa, but from what I understood, um, he was only a right tackle because the guy they started at left tackle could not play on the right side. Yeah. Worst does have some experience at both tackles, and he can play guard. 
Uh, so for a team that needs a lot of help along the offensive line, versatility is key. Give him the nod over a Mackay Beckton. Uh, so worse for me would be the ideal pick of ten. But as long as it's Simmons or an offensive lineman, I'm really okay with it. Yeah, and I, and I'll tell you from an offensive line perspective nowadays, I think you just go athletic. I, if yep. two, if you're splitting hairs between the guy, I'll take the smaller, maybe a little bit weaker guy. If if he's yep. far more athletic, because that's just where the game is going. Is you you yep. have to be able to get out in space, and just like yep. defensive guys have to be able to tackle in space, offensive guys have to be able to block in space. Yeah, we're, we're letting uh, we're yeah. letting defensive linemen go by you in a lot of these blocking schemes and hitting guys yep. in quick slants, and you just got to be able to block somebody much smaller and faster than you. Um, so well, I, even in the, I in like the, that in the run game too. If we're going to start, you know, we're really I'm sorry, it seems like they're bringing Kareem Hunt back. We already have Nick Chubb. I mean, we're going to be running this wide zone team. Uh, it's about getting some of these guys out in the space too. And I've seen some tape on works where he's, you know, he's acting as a pull guy or he's leading the running back down the field. And you know, sometimes you see that happen. The running back is sort of running a little bit slower, with waiting for his blocks to set up. Not when works is running. When works is running. Unless you got, I don't know, a world class sprinter, you know, as, as your running back, you don't have to wait as a running back to let him set up blocks and wait for things to happen. You can maybe cut and go a little bit quicker. Uh, this guy can really get up the field. But I want to go back to something you said real quick, and I'm not trying to pick on you here, but as far as him being a little bit weaker, um, I don't know if you guys saw the video of him uh, doing that hang uh, clean lift in Iowa. He set a, a school record doing a hang clean at 450 pounds, which is basically taking a barbell. Uh, or a dumbbell, or yeah, barbell off the ground with 450 pounds on it, and throw it up to his chest, and he did that three times to set a, 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 an Iowa record. So, wow! Don't mistake this guy for being a little bit smaller. I mean, this guy will push. I, I, if it was between him and the much bigger Mackay Beckton, you know, in a, a heavyweight champion fight, Beckton probably take it because he's that much bigger and stronger. But Wolf isn't going to go down a lot of fight. This guy's going to be strong too. So he, he's not just a, a smaller, athletic guy, you know. Sort of like Chris, you'll, you'll understand it. Like a Joe Thomas, yes, he wasn't going to yeah. overpower oh. anybody. Now I'm not, I'm Armstrong. not, I'm not saying Chris, Chris Works is going to be Joe Thomas, uh, but you know he's not going to, you know he's not Joe Thomas wasn't going to necessarily overpower somebody who's more of a technician. Works can still overpower somebody. I mean, Beck can still overpower anybody. Uh, Works is still going to overpower people, and he still has the athletic ability to get out there and run. So, I, I, to me, if I'm, uh, if I'm Whoever the GM of the Browns is today, I guess that Andrew Barry, um, I, I would I would make him the pick of ten. I like it. I like it. Um, I'm I'm with you on on those types of things. So let's let's talk a little Browns talk. All right. So last week yeah. Gary and I were I don't even know what we were talking about. The Cleveland Browns. Or not, I guess it's in we the Cleveland guy. Tony, so Tony it's a radio Grossi. guy. Yeah, Tony Grossi. He Tony didn't Grossi. necessarily work for, Grossi, whatever, for the whatever. for the Cleveland Browns. Um, he yeah. he was suspended. Did he ever get fired, or did he just no, no, do no. a suspension? He's, he's, he's back at work. We know I that. I don't know that he's back at work yet. Um, Dave, do you know he that? Was, I know, he, he was given an indefinite suspension, and he's more of a – so he's on the radio now. He's on the ESPN affiliate here in Cleveland. He wrote for the Cleveland Plain Dealer and Cleveland.com for a long time. Um, and he actually kind of got that taken away from him based on a couple of things he said about former owner Randy Lerner um, publicly. He made a couple of – jabs that I mean there's taking a shot at somebody and then there's kind of going over the line uh, I'm good at that he so yeah he, he, so, he, so, <laughs> he sort of did some of those things and, you know his, so the his learners are the of, own, are yeah. they the owners of the Indians uh I'm no uh, yeah the Randy learner was the former owner of the uh of the Cleveland Browns oh hey yeah. are they the the yeah. learners that are the owner of the Nationals I wonder there's you know, a learner sure family that, that owns the Washington Nationals Anyway, I know he uh, he, he owns a soccer team now. I don't know if he has any. I don't know if he has any disruptions. I think all these guys own soccer teams now. All right. Well, yeah, exactly. so I, I I went. I guess we went off with a little change there. Um, I hope this guy doesn't get fired. I don't want him to lose his job. I don't. I don't think what he said is the worst thing in the world. What do you think? So what it is, and it, you, you put this in a vacuum, uh, what he said. And it's not, you know, everyone's entitled to their personal opinion, uh, and that's fine. You know, if you want to get technical about it, he's a beat writer, and his job by definition is to take the facts and report those. He's not supposed to necessarily put a spin on that, at least as far as his writing goes. Okay, I'm with you on that. This isn't an opinionist, this isn't a columnist. Uh, those lines sort of get blurred. Um, what he said in a vacuum isn't necessarily that bad, aside from you know the quote-unquote vulgar language. Um, 
the issue is that this isn't a one-time thing. Um, he and Baker, and I heard you guys talk about the Jesus Tony thing, Gary. I, yeah. I know you brought that up. Oh yeah. Um, he from from jump, and it's kind of funny because you know everyone's got opinions on on these draft prospects when they come out, on these players when they're coming out, um, and not all of the opinions are positive, as you would expect. It seems like he really took issue with Baker Mayfield, almost took it personally that the Browns would go out and draft him. Um, and sort of has seemed to make it a vendetta to kind of get jabs on him anywhere that he can. Uh, that whole Jesus Tony thing started. He asked Baker Mayfield a question after a loss, and he asked Baker a question. Baker tries to give him an answer, and then Tony Grossi keeps trying to talk over him over and over and over again. Finally, Baker, after a game that he lost, and probably not great with anyway, just got fed up with him and said, I'm trying to give you an answer. You know, basically shut your damn mouth. Um, as far as the way he, the ironic thing about all this stuff that Tony Gilsey has done, because you figure all oh, this, you know, he's giving an opinion on a guy, you know, Baker should look his roll on the shoulder. I'm actually blocked by Tony Gilsey on Twitter. Uh, and so is <laughs> half of Cleveland who is on Twitter. Because anytime you respond to Tony Gilsey on Twitter, it doesn't even have to be anything that you're, you know, you don't have to be mean to the guy. You could just necessarily disagree with him and he will block you. That's not an exaggeration. You start talking to people on Cleveland Twitter, and they'll all show you they're blocked at. It's kind of a thing on Twitter now. Oh, yeah, I'm blocked by Tony Grossi. Well, everybody's blocked by Tony Grossi. I don't know who Tony Grossi tweets to because he literally has half of the city blocked on Twitter if you disagree with him. So wow. the fact that he has all these opinions about somebody, and then he gets so hurt when you have a different opinion, kind of makes it, – it, it, it's talking out of both sides of your mouth. I think that's kind of what people are sick of the act with him is that – it would be one thing if he talked all of this stuff and then if you came back at him, he'd either engage you or, you know, do whatever. There's not even a response out of him. The media blocked. Um, and he's sort of one of these guys too. He's been, he's been talking, he's been on the ground beat for you know years, ever since before they moved, I believe. Um, it's sort of a thing where he's the old guard now and the NFL is kind of moving into the 21st century. And he still thinks that the only two plays should be, you know, run left and run right. So, so I'm okay with it, that. I didn't, people, I didn't... I didn't know all of all of that. What what I guess mm -hmm. I don't want them to do is I don't want them to hire somebody who's going to come in and just be a yes man to the NFL because there are yeah. many 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 beat writers for the NFL <clears throat> that work in these cities that that just coddle the teams and I'm not okay yeah. with that. I'm just at some point yeah. in time you have to be okay with challenging a team and telling them they've done something wrong. And well, yep. and the fans want an answer for it, um, and, yep. and and I think that we are getting so far away from that. Almost eighty percent, I would say eighty percent of the NBA media right now is just oh, fanboys. It is the yep, it's the worst thing to follow because you know yep. the answer before you get it. And if they do something yep. stupid, if they make a draft pick or or make a bad trade or or make a bad free agent move or whatever, you're only going to get the team's answer. The, the, the coached up and nobody challenges anybody. And I, I yeah. like this guy. Now I didn't know that he had like a personal thing against Baker. You also can't come in unbiased either. Right. You know, right. my, my criticisms of Baker were, I didn't know anything about him. I knew a lot about him. I didn't know how I felt about him being number one overall, but he's my quarterback. And for the first time in a long time, the team looks really good. I'm all in, let's yeah. go. And I learned yeah. really quick in week, you know, two, three, four, uh, this is not the Baker from the last couple of weeks of, of the previous season. Something has right. happened. His accuracy is gone. Um, his athletic, athletic ability is not very good. His decision making is awful. And yep. you know, I, I'm ready. I'm ready to move on. If this is going to be the Baker we get, you know, I I do believe in us now. Of course, every Cleveland Cleveland fans want patience. My problem with patience is, is I, I, I believe that to an extent, but I also believe as sure. soon as you know you have a losing hand, fold it. Because we've been waiting, sure. you know, 20 years for, for something good. I don't want to waste five on seeing is this the right thing or not, you know? Well, if, for a few reasons on that, too. One, now there's a precedent for it. You know, it used to be you drafted a quarterback and you're living and dying with him to lose to his rookie deal. Yep. I mean, just last year we saw uh, the Cardinals take Tyler Murray, you know, at the top of the draft. A year after taking Josh Rosen, so yeah. now there's a with not only hang on a for that. with a far worse team than the Browns, and Kyler Murray oh, not, looked not substantially better than Baker did. Yeah. So, not even yeah. close. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you 100. percent With um, a questionable head coach, 
that has never yeah, succeeded yeah. in college or in the pros and you know yeah yep yeah. yeah. yeah no I, I agree and there's there's a lot that went into Baker his, his stumbling last year a lot of it's on him you know I'm not I've got three Baker Mayfield jerseys I was driving the base Baker Mayfield bus long before the draft coach came out saying oh there's a chance they take the number one overall in my mind he was QB one you know for I remember that we so we I'm, had those conversations. Oh, we definitely did. Yeah, we definitely did. You and I went back and forth on that. I believe. Hang um, on. I do want to ask, do you remember the quarterback I wanted us to take? Josh Allen, right? No. Initially, you wanted Josh Allen. Did you, did you, were you Lamar? Were you team Lamar? I was t- I've, I've been beating the Lamar train when Lamar was a sophomore and, and just wrecking the ACC. When he, when he outplayed, my car. when he outplayed Watson with the roster from Louisville and Watson had the roster from Clemson. I said, this guy's going to destroy the NFL. He's got nobody on this team. I I liked him, too. I think a large part of that, too, and um, I could go off on a tangent in a couple of weeks, too, (laughs) is when you get a guy like Lamar, obviously, you know, everyone's going to look back on last year and say, oh, my God, Lamar took the year by storm. Where was not a lot of people want to talk about the year before uh, when he looked like the show of what he looked like last year. So a large part of that goes to him because he even admitted at one point, hey, I did not feel comfortable. This is him saying this. I didn't feel comfortable throwing the football in the NFL. This is a quarterback. I didn't feel comfortable throwing the football. Now, obviously, you look at his numbers last year, look at what he did last year, and he looked pretty darn comfortable throwing the football around. I mean, yep. the guy looked really, really good. And he put in a ton of work in the offseason. But so much of the credit, uh, in addition to Lamar, has to go to uh, you know Harbaugh and his coaching staff around him. Totally agree. Not only get him in that type of a position, but to put an offense around him to succeed. I mean, there were times where they would line up with you know two, three running backs in the backfield. You know they're running. You see that there's no receivers on the field. You know they're running, and Ingram dripping off eight, nine yards in a carry. You know consistently. Yep. And that really goes a long way to open up the passing game too. But give him a credit for sure. He uh, you know he. He turned himself, he earned everything that he got. You can't take that away from him. You know, on the other side of that coin now, we've got Baker Mayfield, who not only does not have an offense maybe tailored to his needs, he didn't have somebody like Harbaugh who was really riding him to get better. Freddie Kitchen sort of gave Baker Mayfield a quarterback in his second year in the NFL, the key to a Ferrari, and said, well, go ahead and do whatever you want to do. Freddie Kitchen's got the job based on his relationship with Baker Mayfield. So that's my biggest and problem is that's of- that's a chicken and an egg problem. They let yep. they let a a nine year old basically make the decision yep. for the franchise. Yeah. And yep. and you and can't you can't ask was- a one year guy that has started nine games, hey, who do you want to be your coach and who do you want to lead the franchise for the next decade? That that that, that no, guy doesn't he, get that decision. He doesn't know how to win in the NFL yet. I mean, there's guys who have been in the league 10 years as far as going that stuff, and they don't even have that sort of input. So I agree. Uh, and I, I don't think they should. Upon, but maybe they should, but they don't. And that's what it comes down to is that they gave the power to a guy who's been in the league only for a year, who's only started 13 or 14 games or whatever it was up to that point. More power than he should have. If I'm Baker, I'm thinking, well, they're asking me my opinion. Of course, I'm going to give it to him. You know, Baker's never been shy about giving anybody an opinion. Um, so I don't necessarily blame him for that. I don't blame, blame him. him. No, him that's for, that. It's a bad situation for him to be in. I blame right. him for his so performance. What, well, the Browns, what, the Browns what, basically that, tried the to do the, the NBA thing, right? That's what right. He could have con- what he could have controlled was coming into camp in better shape. You know, knowing the playbook a little bit better. Yeah, uh, you know, he could have spent the offseason working on his footwork, doing this, doing that. You know, there's a lot of things that he could have done better. So I'm not knocking him off the coaching push from the by any means. Uh, you know, he, he's got to put in the work this offseason. He's got as much of a chip on his shoulders as what he said. We're going to see coming into year three. If not, you know, you're going to know pretty quick, I think, whether or not Baker Mayfield is the guy that's going to be for it or if he's not the guy that's going to be for it. This is the offseason that he's got to put the work in. And if he doesn't do that, you know, I, I think his time will probably be, you know, coming to a close relatively soon. I'm good with that. I appreciate that. I'm willing to give him this year. My issues with mm-hmm. Baker is, is I don't know. I don't think he's got the the skin for it. I just think he's so thin skinned. He gets so he reads all of the press clippings, good and bad. Yeah. And yeah. one of the things that I wish the Browns would do this offseason, they might do it, they might not, is I think they should bring another quarterback into that room and challenge him. Where did he do yeah. his best? When he was at Texas Tech and he got he got he lost his job basically to Patrick Mahomes and sure. he he gets to 
Um, you know, he, he lost his scholarship, basically. He has to earn his spot. He has to earn his reason to be there. And then he has yep. to take over for a Heisman Trophy guy, whatever, and, and, and get, get the keys to Oklahoma. He's got to earn that. He's always being pushed. He's always being doubted. And then in Cleveland, yep. you're taking number one overall, and you're given the keys to the franchise, and now he doesn't have to beat anybody out. And so – I just want him to be challenged. I want him to be pushed. That's why I'm not afraid of them drafting it. Now, not maybe with the first pick, obviously. We need too many things. But at some point in time, I want to find a quarterback, and I'm not talking about just bringing some old guy and and who's going to, you know, be a good, capable, competent backup and teach him to be a, you know, a leader. I want somebody who's going to push him, who's going to challenge him. Yeah. And I, I, I don't think that really is wrong. I, I, I wouldn't blame him if they did that. I don't know if he would really help. There's the veterans out there. I mean, the free agent quarterback in this class, first of all, are ridiculous. I mean, Drew Brees, Tom Brady, uh, Philip Rivers, those three guys alone, you never see even. You no, know, they, they, they never hit the market. In the history yeah, of the NFL, happened. they've never hit the market. Yep. Yeah, so I, I, I don't think you're going to see them bringing a guy like that. Um, I do think they need somebody in there who is able to be a veteran stabilizing presence. Um, as far as challenging him goes, obviously, you know, Competition only breeds success, so that's not a bad thing. Um, you know, there's there's uh, the two names that have been brought up here locally, uh, uh, either Case Keenum or Chase Daniel. Uh, neither one of those guys can make you do cartwheels. Uh, <laughs> what about Mariota? Uh, but, I mean, if Mariota's well, not good enough to be a starter consistently, but he's he's at, he just can't stay healthy, maybe nobody's going to pay yeah. him starter money. Can can Cleveland bring him in? Because that would be the guy that – because when he's healthy – he can start and outplay Baker all day long. You, it's just hard to give him the keys to your franchise because man, he's only going to give you about nine of 16 games. Yeah. And see, that's the thing there. You know, the best ability is availability. So maybe uh, uh, him in a backup role would make some sense because he's sort of been through the, you know, the NFL machine to this point. He could help Baker a little bit as far as that goes. And you're talking um, about systems. I, I don't know that that guy's had the same offensive coordinator any year at all. No. Exactly. And who can relate to that point in the Cleveland quarterback? So, you know, that's <laughs> yes. someone who's able to kind of, it's almost like a kindred spirit at that point. I'm still putting, as far as my quarterback wish list, I actually put together a clean list of the guys that I want. Um, and not at the top, but as far as the position goes, the quarterback position, uh, my guy is Case Keenum just because he has that familiarity with Kevin Stefanski's personality. Yep. Uh, so now you're bringing a guy who's been, a, he, he's had a couple of different roles in the NFL as far as starters, as far as backup. You know, he got that one big contract, so he's familiar with kind of that spot like he's falling down so he knows you know what mistakes that you know you can make what mistakes are waiting for you what pitfalls there are but he also has a familiarity with uh with kevin stefanski and some of the things that he likes to do on offense because stefanski was uh the quarterback coach in minnesota when case Keenum was it um so i think that move would make a lot of sense uh because if something happens to baker whether it's injury or whether they just say you know what's this guy we're going in some direction you know case team is not going to be but it's promised land but he's someone who, if you look at his numbers, has relatively decent numbers, and you wouldn't feel uncomfortable starting him for you know a stretch of games at a time if you had to do that for whatever reason. And if you do want to go in a different direction, uh, or if you want to move on from Baker Mayfield, he is still young enough and has enough talent where you could use him as a bridge quarterback uh, to your next guy. I can't believe we're talking about this now. I thought all this was going to be taken care of already. <laughs> uh, but here we are talking about bridge quarterbacks from Cleveland Browns for 2021. Hey, man, uh, I, listen, I, I like the idea. I think Stefanski realizes the, the league is a win-now league. There are no rebuilding. Sure. And I think the Browns are loaded on talent for the most part. And mm-hmm. and it's one of those situations where if he thinks they're ready to win and Case gives them the chance, he'll pull Baker. And he'll run mm-hmm. with the guy that leads them a chance to win. Remember, he's, you say he's nothing to do cartwheels about, but this cat led Minnesota – with a team that didn't look a whole hell of a lot different than Cleveland right now, really right. good defense exactly. and yep. a shoddy offensive line, great run game yep. though, and great skill yep. players, and and yep. he led them to. I mean, they got their butt whooped by the Eagles, but he led them to the NFC Championship game. Hey, you know what? As a Browns fan, I thought to get my butt whooped in the championship game. So oh, championship oh game. man, that's the biggest <laughs> win of our life if that happens. You're not kidding. You're not kidding. Yeah, I'll t- I'll take a 40 point drumming to Philadelphia, or, or I guess it'd be to as long as it's not to the Steelers, I'm happy. So as long as it's not to the Steelers, I'm okay. But yeah, just getting into the playoffs and whatever happens happens. But no, I I think that move makes a lot of sense. I think one way or another, they're going to address the quarterback position in the offseason. 
you know, whether it's a, a, a veteran guy who you sort of, you know, another quarterback coach and what that ends up being, I'm not really sure. But I think you're going to see a new face in here. I don't think they're bringing Drew Stanton back. I don't even know if Drew Stanton can walk. So uh, I'm pretty sure that we're going to see a new quarterback, whether that's, you know, through the draft or free agency or both. Or maybe, you know, I, I know Andy Dalton's out there. I can't imagine he's locking these things up. But, um, you know, trading for a guy like Andy Dalton. Uh, I think yeah, I don't want to give up assets. I'd rather pay money for somebody right now than, than give up any any assets whatsoever. I would too, but if you, if you can get a service of a guy for a fifth round draft pick, you know, that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Oh, true, but I just, I, for some reason, I feel like he's going to demand a little bit higher price. I, I think he's pretty capable, probably. competent, and stable. Probably. Um, probably. Yeah, probably. We'll, we'll get you, we'll get you out of, get you out of here on this. My, my issues. So we've talked a lot about Baker and I, and I have, I have yeah. issues. I have issues with him um, yeah. being, I guess it's, it's all just his ability to handle, the pressure and and handle the the life of being an NFL quarterback and and being a star, yep. Um, yep. being a being a Browns fan, he caught this city by fire. My only problem with him right now is the he criti- anybody who criticizes him is dead to him. And before yep. I started last week calling him a bitch and actually calling him names, okay, which which if I could go back in time. I, I'm totally confident and capable of calling him a baby all day long. Cry baby all day long. Yeah. I wish I wouldn't have called him a bitch, but I did it. I said it. Um, it it's not something I think is wrong. It's just something I wish I wouldn't have said publicly uh, the way I did. But my problem is he he's one of these guys where if you don't wear brown and orange, you don't mean nothing, and he assumes anybody yeah. who criticizes him, I don't like the you don't play, so your opinion doesn't matter because – I always throw up the three greatest coaches, the three Bills, Bill Belichick, Bill Parcells, uh, Bill Walsh. I, I don't know that any of those people ever played it down to football. Are you telling me that they don't have an opinion about the game that's intelligent or smart or can make yeah. someone better? Um, I don't like that. And then I think he challenges fans that criticize him saying, well, you are you should just tote the water for us. And I'm that is yeah. something I'm just never going to be. If you're great, I'm in with you. Even if you lose and you make mistakes, I'm going to tell you I was a defender of Miles Garrett. Like he hit a dude in the face and he shouldn't have done it, and it was a bad situation. But I'm really glad he's back, and nobody loves Miles more than me. I promise you. I promise you. Look, I would have hit him in the face. It's okay. Like I get it. I've been angry before and just wanted to pop off on somebody. I've lost control. It happens. Definitely. But I, you just can't say because most I know Cleveland fans now. I married into some of this stuff. I've been a Browns fan since the mid nineties, right before yeah. they lost the team. Um, and then when they got it back, but like, I don't, I don't go the years that you and Jason and our other friends have gone through. I mean, y'all have got lifetime of this. And if you were to be critical of the team and the star quarterback question, question my fandom, you've been here for five yeah. minutes, man. And as soon as yeah, somebody yeah. else hands you a bigger check, you would leave in two seconds. So let's yeah. let's watch your mouth. That's the things that I, I I hate about him. I I agree with that to a point. The one thing I will say is I always want a guy to be authentic, and you know I want him to be who he is. And if you follow Baker throughout his career, now I'm not making this use of him. Some of the crappy pulls I see are stupid. Um, it's one of those things where. If he's winning and the team's winning and he does the same thing, everybody loves him. Because the team's losing and he's still doing some of the stuff, you know, it rubs people the wrong way. You know, it's one thing when you, you know, you're talking a bunch of shit when your team's winning and, you know, everyone looks good and you're, you know, look at me, I'm the greatest thing ever. And everyone's losing. You sort of like when the, look at LeBron James is a perfect example of that in his relationship with Cleveland. He's here and everybody loves him. That guy could, could have gone on the Euclid Avenue, shot someone in the head from point blank rage, the entire Cleveland police watching him do it, and he would be found innocent at a trial on his peers. Oh, and he wouldn't even went to trial. But like, what are you talking he about? He wouldn't even went to trial. That was exactly. self defense. That guy shouldn't have been standing there. <laughs> exactly. But the same guy between his two stints in Cleveland, if he would have done the same thing in Miami, you know, he was with Miami and Cleveland, this city would have had, not just burned his jersey, burned him. I mean, that was the end of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So a lot of this is perception. You know, Baker is sort of, uh, Guy who maybe you could say, you know, not maybe you could say, takes things personally, has a chip on the shoulder, however you want to put it. He's always sort of been like that. And I kind of think that's his way of getting up and motivating himself 
you know, you mentioned the kind of tech, tech uh, you know, he went up and had a fantastic year. His his, his year was started. Lost his, now he ended up losing his job to Patrick Mahomes. So yeah. That, I look, I'm not going to knock I mean, a guy from losing your job, Patrick. Schultz. Only the fact that we could have had Patrick Mahomes in that draft, but you know, I'm, you yeah, know, there, there is there is that. I don't want to go ahead and make a list of people who the Browns could have had because we could be talking about this until next Tuesday night. Um, but you know, he's he's always sort of been that way. You know, he, he's always had to work super hard for everything he has. That's sort of what he needed to motivate himself. So when he goes after a guy like Colin Cowherd, who said Baker Mayfield was undraftable, or he goes after you know beat writers like Tony Dorsey, or he even goes after play on. That's sort of the way he is. So on one hand, I'm okay with that because I always want him. I don't. I don't want him to be phony. I want him to be authentic, and I want him to do whatever he's going to do to get himself ready for games. The issue becomes when maybe you come into a season a little bit overweight. Maybe when you admit things like, "Hey, we thought this was going to be easier than what it ended up being." Things that happened, by the way, with with Baker Mayfield on the ground, and you start losing games, and you still continue to talk the way you did. Whether it's authentic or not, it comes off as phony. It comes off as you being a bully, and it comes off as really you not knowing what you're doing. So, uh, I think that's sort of the way he is. And if the Browns get back to winning, people you're going to see people trend back to being okay with it. And he's not really going to change. Um, it just gets old and it gets stale really, really quickly after year after year after year of losing. And like you said, Chris, you've been you know as far as making me goes, you've been here for five minutes. Who are you to tell? I mean, forget about me, who's been a Browns fan, you know, my entire 34 years of life. What about my dad and my grandfather who's been watching these teams for how long? Yep. And, you know, all they've seen is lose, 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 lose. And here comes Baker Mayfield, who has, you know, nine good games and starting. He's going to start telling everybody how to be a fan of the Browns. So I get his act wearing thin on a lot of people. I just think that's how he is. And I don't think it's going to change. And, you know, in a league where you know, we talked about it earlier, if things don't go well, he's only got a small window to kind of capitalize on everything. You may as well go out there and shoot your shot and be who you're going to be because you're either going to get cut or you're going to make it one way or the other. So be yourself, and if that's if that's who he is, fine. You know, at the end of the day, we're going to find out whether he's worth all the talk he puts up or not. I'm I'm with going after the media guys. I get that. That is free reign. They give an opinion. You have an opinion on their opinion. That that is they yeah. we have free market. I'm free market for anybody. Not that we're real media. We're Small compared to those yeah. guys. Um, going off on the fans. The going off on the fans. That what was it? Week. It was either week seventeen or week sixteen. It was a. It, he had had an awful season at the end of the year last year, and he's threatening to year, fight. Yeah. He was threatening to fight guys in the dog pound. Yeah. And these guys have been ticket holders for their life. And you're yeah. you're so saying come you down know. here and say this to me? Come on, man. Yeah. You know now, the one thing. That we, the one thing I will say too, and you see this one. Uh, I know a couple of years ago. Uh, there was a fan who came onto the court, and I think he pissed Russell Westbrook after the game. Um, and, you know, you see Russell Westbrook's reaction to that. And if that's all that you saw, you think, you know, what, what's, what's Russell's problem? You don't necessarily know what the fan said to Baker to egg that on. You know, if I'm a fan, especially when I'm a Brown fan, whether I like it or not, you've got to realize that he's probably frustrated. Yeah. So that situation is sort of a powder keg anyway. Uh, you know, if, if you see a, a, a gallon of gasoline and leak it on the ground, it's probably not a good idea to throw your cigarette at him after you've done smoking. You know what I mean? <laughs> so you kind of got to know where you are. Um, so you don't necessarily know what this guy said to Baker. To, to kind oh, of I'm sure. I'm sure it was awful. But Listen, I, say, I've said awful sure things on fans. I've, you know, you know, I'm yeah. sure it was terrible. To, That's just one of those things where you throw your, the helmet on sure. and you look for it, right. and to, to as soon as it's time, exactly. run out the dog pound. You got to move on from it. Exactly. Yeah. You just got to yeah. move on from it and say, you know, this guy is an idiot. He doesn't. He may not necessarily mean what he's saying because I'll bet you a million dollars that same guy sees Baker Mayfield on the street. He's going to pull off his ground hat and ask him to sign it. So that's 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 what we're <laughs> dealing with here. Um, I, I I just think you're right. Baker's got to whether he wants to talk or not talk talk whatever you whatever. You, Football, focusing on football, getting better football has to be his number one priority. Not what Colin Cowherd's saying, not what Tony Grossi's saying, not what, you know, everybody's saying about him in podcasts and on the radio and things. Yeah. If you focus on football, all that stuff's going to take care of itself. And I think that's really what, something that he really learned uh, this year is that he's really going to have his focus in that direction. Well, I'm, I'm pumped about the season once again. I'm already getting ready for it now that we're getting draft time. I I, yep, I like yep. Stavansky a lot. He wasn't my first choice, but I get that he yeah. was their choice last year. And for some yep. reason, they let Baker make the decision. Um, but uh, but but he probably would have been my second choice this year. So that's I'm okay with that. And yep, um, I'm, I'm with it. the team is we're super. T- I, I would venture to say that if you were to 
grade the all 32 teams off of blue chip talent and things of that nature, then the Browns are up there as one of the most talented teams in the league. Nobody can touch us skill wise. From a skill position yeah. player, there's there's not a team in the league that has running backs and receivers and tight ends as good as ours. It they just don't yeah. exist. True. And then I think I, that we have a really good to great player at every level of the defense. Now all eleven aren't great, but we are blue chip at all three levels. I think that's important. Yeah, I think so too. You know, obviously they need some help in the trenches. They need some help with the depth. Uh, but, and we got to have the cornerbacks really, be yeah. healthy. That's the biggest thing. Health, health last year yeah, from the secondary perspective killed us. It was terrible. But we we also need you know we need some upgrades in the secondary. Demarius Randall was a disappointment last year, and he's yes. gone. Uh, you know, as far as linebackers go, it's, it's been reported that they're not bringing back Joe Schober. Um And you know, I don't know what Christian Kirksey's status is as far as you know his health goes. There's a chance they don't bring him back either. He's trying to save some cap, which makes sense. Yeah, Isaiah Simmons was even better at the 10 spot or moving up to get somebody like that. Um, but obviously, you know, they've got talented defense as far as Miles Garrett goes. Uh, I like Jason Richardson. Um, they got some pieces there. Um, I do think there are a couple pieces away on defense, mostly in the front seven. Just get a safety at some point. Uh, you know, I know Anthony Harris is a free agent from Minnesota, so that would make a lot of sense. Uh, really, Chris, you and I talk about this all the time. This game is won and lost in the trenches. If That's they all. invest in the trenches right now, this team's going to be probably fine. They're in a tough division, but they should be able to compete. I, I, I've, I've said this for a long time. I actually think the quarterback position is like the fourth or fifth position that I would address if I had to build yeah. a team right now from scratch simply because sure. we're watching guys like Kyler Murray come in year one and light the league up. Like, it, yep. I know this is going to sound ridiculous because it's the most important position, but I think there are so many quarterbacks that – come in every year that can play this game that if you build the team first and then get a quarterback, I think almost anybody that played at a high level in college and has the the attributes you need to be a good quarterback in the NFL can succeed. Yep. No, and it, 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 you look at, I mean, you, you mentioned Lamar Jackson. If Lamar Jackson gets drafted by the Cleveland Browns the year he got drafted by the Ravens, there is not a chance in hell he's having all the success this year that he had with Baltimore. That's maybe, true. Maybe that, not you know, that. Maybe not that level, but I think he's still. I think that guy is elite. I really do. I think he figures it out. Yeah, but they built an yeah, offense well, got, around him. And you don't think him. OBJ and and he would have done something with OBJ? OBJ sure had what like three fine, touchdowns the entire season. No, I, how many I, would he have had with Lamar? I think that the Browns were not smart enough to build an offense around him. Well, Freddie Kitchens wasn't smart enough, but that's that guy's problem. not smarter than anybody on this podcast right that, now. But that's what I'm saying. <laughs> like, if you, uh, like you got to have the right guys in place at the top, too. The, well, the I, Ravens the, were the, smart yeah. enough to do that. Yeah. Well. Yeah, well, that's the thing. You know, the, the talk this year about Joe Burrow and, oh, is he going to want to go to Cincinnati and play there? Does he want to not? You know, a lot of the talk is, you know, not necessarily what Joe Burrow wants, but you see some, uh, you know, a quarterback who's somewhat talented or even very talented, if he was to be put in a situation like, let's say, somehow Joe Burrow wound up on the Colts this year. You know, they'd move up to get him, whatever the case may be. He's plug and play, and that team's going back to the playoffs right away because they have a solid team. I mean, the Colts aren't even necessarily that good of a team outside of a few solid positions. You know, their offensive line is okay. I don't know if anybody better than the Browns. They have T.Y. Hilton. They have a couple other pieces there. But that is an established team who already knows how to win, who would add a player like a Joe Burrow. They have a, so they have a head coach, and they have a head coach and a GM that are elite-level smart. That's the thing. You put a guy like that on a team who is already, you know, in, in, in a well-established situation, and those guys are going to succeed. You know, you, you, you drop some of these other younger players around with, with, you know, a shoddy offensive line and no skill players and all this other stuff, and it's never going to work. So I, I, I think you're right. You know, obviously, quarterback is the marquee position. And it's sort of a catch-22 because you can't win without it. I mean, how many years have the Browns had, you know, when they had Joe Thomas, uh, Vittorio obviously still have him. They had all these you know, players along the offensive line. Mitchell, they had Mitchell Schwartz at right tackle. Um, they had a very good offensive line. The year we and had Mac, Thomas. I mean, we had yeah, like Alex four Mack, pro yeah. bowlers or whatever that year at right. our line. Exactly. Yep, and we were exactly. garbage. And, you know, we, garbage. Right. Well, they, had, they, had, they had Brian Hoyer, who the guy was okay. But, you know, the thing is, Ryan Hoyer looked okay because of the offensive line that he was behind. That's right. Imagine dropping a quarterback who was actually able to. Yeah, Josh, Josh Gordon. Josh Gordon didn't hurt. 
<laughs> Josh Gordon didn't hurt, but Josh Gordon had his own issues too. He was on the field half the time too. The so, the I mean, the, the one good. the one year that he blew up though, that Hoyer looked yeah. great before he blew his ACL out. That yep, that was yep. the year the offensive line was great, and Josh Gordon just yep. said, "I'll catch." He missed four games and still led the league in in yardage. Oh, it was ridiculous. Yep. yep. And everyone said, "Okay, here we go. We, you know, maybe it's Hoyer, maybe you know, we're going to add a quarterback and you know, crazy draft or whatever." But yeah, you, you like you said, you build these teams from the inside out, yep. and I think maybe it might be a little bit more frustrating and it makes it a little bit harder to try to find a quarterback. But if you can really hit on that guy, I look at the Saints yeah, for this too. Uh, not to get off on a whole other tangent to know you guys have other stuff to talk about tonight. <laughs> but they are a team who built their offensive line. Well, obviously, Drew Brees has been there for a while, but they invested so much, not just at the tackle position, too. I actually looked at this because Drew Brees and Baker have similar statues. And I had heard that when you have a shorter quarterback, it's not necessarily a hindrance. It's all in how you construct things around you, right? So the interior of the offensive lineman, when you have a quarterback who is on the shorter side, like a Drew Brees with a Baker Mayfield, becomes almost as important or even maybe more important in tackle spots because those are the guys that are, you know, obviously keeping center and pocket wide, but opening up pass lanes for someone who's not 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, and all the Saints did in 2018 was spent most money on the interior offensive line position over everybody else in the NFL. So moving a guy like Kevin Zaytler out of here to bring in Olivier Vernon, yeah, that might look good because you're bringing supposedly you're bringing in, you know, pass rushing statistics. But I think that one move there alone did so much to hurt Baker Mayfield's production because it weakened the interior of the offensive line. You took away one obvious, arguably one of the best guards in football, weakened that spot, then weakened the other spots around him, didn't replace Dartmouth with a competent replacement. All of a sudden, you see Baker Mayfield running for his life. You know, people want to bring, there's serious talk about people wanting to bring Tom Brady onto the Cleveland Browns last year. Now, Chris, I know you're a Tom Brady fanatic. Tom Brady, if we know one thing about him, is that he is a statue in the pocket. Can you imagine Tom Brady behind that offensive line? I mean, the man would get killed. I, we just, dis- we're just, we're that. just going to disagree there. He wouldn't. He just wouldn't. He there's a math well, formula. Yeah, I, there's a math formula there. His offensive line in in with the Patriots last two years was hot garbage. But you get the ball bad. out he, quickly. You, know, you find hot reads. Sure, he, you you he know he literally out, takes three steps true. one direction and makes everybody miss yep. him and buys him five more seconds. So Second. yeah, well. I, I agree he knows how to navigate the pocket a little better. I guess my point was you bring in a, a quarterback who – Baker Mayfield – But that guy's a genius, and Baker is as far from a genius as we could get. I mean – He's got a long way to go. But yeah. Let's say uh, may, may, maybe it be the bad example. Put Philip Rivers back there, another guy who can't – That would hurt. That would hurt. Yeah. Pretty well. That would exactly. hurt. Exactly. You know, because he is you, a letter-rip, tater-chip kind of guy, and he's he's <laughs> not moving anywhere, and he's not solving <laughs> any physics yeah, yeah. problems. No. <laughs> no, he's not. But, you know – to, to, to cut myself off and go on a long rant here is no, you're good. Just build this from the in, build this from the inside out. You know, use these draft picks. Yeah, if I hit him as there at ten, you but use these draft picks and use this offseason to acquire offensive line talent. You don't have to make any huge wholesale changes to the offense. Just address those things, and you're going to be fine. I think the team will start to roll. I, I I like I said, I think we've got talent. I worry about the mm-hmm. the trigger man. I worry about that position because when it's not good, it's not good. Here's my other thing, and I'm going to catch a lot of flack for this. Okay, I I loved Cleveland, and I still do. I don't I don't have any qualms about it. My Baker's left a bad taste in my mouth, and I need I need him to do a little something sweet to to get to get that out of there. But um, or or to be replaced. But I would rather him just be successful. That would be the best situation yeah. for it. Um, my problem is this. I was an all-in on Lamar guy. There was 28 teams I was happy with him going to, and he went to one that I didn't. And I've never hated Cincinnati because they kind of haven't ever been really a threat to the Browns. They're kind of the same as the Browns, so it's hard to hate that team. Um, If Burrow goes there, like Baker's going to be the third quarterback in that in, in in like that division that I'm gonna want to cheer for, I will root for the Browns. I will, but to see Lamar be successful, I I want to see that. I think it's better for the. Yeah. I just think he's exciting and and, and crazy to watch. He, he's a guy too. You know, obviously I agree with you. You know, knowing what I know now about Lamar Jackson, obviously I hate things with the Ravens, but I don't hate Lamar Jackson. He's a guy because he's no. putting all the work in the off season, and he, you know he's a good case and a good story. 
he's a guy who I find myself rooting for. And I probably will root for him on the weeks that the Browns aren't playing on the playoff implications are on the line. Uh, but he's a guy who you, you watch how he plays, you watch how humble he is, you watch how eager he is, you watch how hyped his team is before him, and you can't help but get kind of swept up with that root for him. Um, but yeah, he, the Browns uh, on the whole could be in a real tough situation with him. With Joe Burrow, oh, and by the way, this guy named Big Ben comes back next year. Nah, that he, doesn't scare that me. Guy. Ben Big does not <laughs> yeah. scare me at all. At you know, all. I, I tend to agree when you're talking about, you know, I hope he comes back. Could be. But the thing with them, you know, with, with Ben and with the Steelers, it, it seems like every single year they're going to get written off. And I remember the last couple of times I've, I've said, oh, the Steelers, they're, they're past their time, they're done. One of those times I said that they went one Super Bowl. So, you know, and until until further notice, and I agree, you know, I don't I don't think Rafa's was the same guy that he was two or three years ago. I'll, I'll take Baker crazy, over so. Ben, and I'm I'm okay, I'm good with I, standing on that mountain right I now. Too. And I'm not talking about for but a decade. He, I'm talking about this year. Yeah, I take Baker over Ben. Talking about right now. Yeah. But at the same token, you know, you, you look at Lamar, you look at probably Joe Burrow, and then you throw Ben in there, and you can make an argument that Baker is the fourth quarterback in the AFC North. True. I mean, I'm, I'm probably one of the few people. Game. Yeah, I'm probably one of the few people that would take Baker over Ben. Or yep. I'm, there are very few non-Cleveland fans that would take Baker over Ben. And, yeah, and, and people, you're right. Like if, you said, if Burrow comes in as a rookie. They're, they're not, yeah. yeah. If Burrow comes so in as a rookie, up. then you're yeah. right. Baker is the yeah. – he goes from being the bell of the ball for one season because of nine games yeah. – to now, yep, to, to now being yeah fourth string in a yep. four horse race. That's it all goes nuts. real fast, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot invested in Burrow being successful. I'm okay with that. I don't yep. care. And I'll tell you this: if Cincinnati wins the Super Bowl, it gives hope to Cleveland. That's not the worst thing sure, in the world. Yep. It means you can change your fortune. You can change your yep, fate. Things, good things can happen. Hopefully, you know. Hopefully our fortunes are changing relatively soon. We'll get real tired about talking about the Browns are taking on the 10th pick of the draft or high up in the draft. <laughs> I want to talk about who the Browns are taking, you know, 28th, 29th, 30th in the draft. Dare I say 31 and 32. That'd be awesome. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate yeah. you coming on. I know you stayed long. Hey. Thank you so much for giving well, us your time, brother. No problem at all. I appreciate you letting me rant for, you know, what was this, two hours. I definitely hey, appreciate that. No, so it was anytime, fantastic. Anytime you need, and I'm a big <laughs> fan of the show, I just wanted to say that. I appreciate what you guys do. Oh, Thank you, buddy. Thank you, buddy. When uh when I'm in Thanks, Cleveland guys. next time I'll uh we'll we'll have to hit you up. Last time I was up there you were out of town. So Yeah, I know you always, you always seem to make it up here when I'm out of town going on vacation. So make sure you get up here, we'll at least go watch a Browns game or grab a beer together for sure. Thank you, sir. Sounds good. Thanks, guys.